I'm going to ask you please to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 9 as we begin this evening. Genesis chapter 9. Last Wednesday evening we began a series entitled, Should a Christian Drink Alcohol? I want to encourage everyone who wasn't here last Wednesday to be sure to get that opening sermon and listen to it because it really was meant to be a foundation that we'll build on each week. It was the introduction, and so I would encourage you, if you were not here, to be sure to get that as we seek to build on that tonight. Genesis chapter 9, we're going to begin reading with verse 18 down to the end of the chapter. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, our desire tonight is to glorify you and to please you in the way that we handle your holy word. We admit that we are not adequate for such a task, but Lord, we thank you that we are made adequate and sufficient by the working of your spirit. And so we ask you tonight, Lord, to bless in that way, to graciously assist us as we seek to preach your truth and be at work in our minds and hearts so that we are able to receive the things that you have for us tonight. Help me, Lord, to make clear the things that you have taught me, and Lord, assist us in understanding those things. Lord, I pray for anyone in our midst tonight who doesn't know you, and I pray that they would see that their great need this very moment is for the life, the forgiveness, the reconciliation that is found in your son Jesus through his death on the cross. Lord, I pray that you would grant them an understanding of that, that they would see their own condition accurately so that they would repent and with a broken heart turn to Christ for life. We ask you for this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes we listen to something, we acknowledge what we're hearing but we don't really hear it. It's possible to interact with truth in such a way that we're aware of it. We could even perhaps repeat it back, but we don't actually let that truth penetrate our thinking. It doesn't really influence us the way it should influence us. It doesn't really affect the way that we think. It doesn't really affect our affections. It doesn't really affect our choices in the way that it would if we really heard it if we really did business with it. In fact, sometimes the truth that we may be most unfamiliar with is the truth that we have quickly agreed with. We say, you know what, that's right, I hear that, I see that in Scripture, I believe that to be true, now let's move on. And so because we have so quickly adopted it and so quickly acknowledged it, we don't really interact with it, and it doesn't influence us the way that God would have it to. I believe that the truth we're going to talk about tonight is a great example of that. There is no Bible-believing person who can say that drunkenness is not a sin. There's no Bible-believing person who could say that God hasn't commanded us not to be drunk. I would imagine that most everyone here tonight, if not everyone here tonight, who professes to be a Christian 
If I say to you tonight that drunkenness is a sin, you would say, Richard, we know that. We agree with that. We believe that. We accept that. We see that in Scripture. Lesson learned. Let's move on. But I have a question for you. Even though we all know that drunkenness is a sin, have you ever gone through the statements made in Scripture about drunkenness and really listened to them? Have you really interacted with them? Have you studied them? Have you really allowed what God says about drunkenness to penetrate your thinking, to influence your affections, and to influence your choices? Have you so assumed this truth that you really haven't interacted with it? I'll put it to you a different way. Why preach what the Bible says about drunkenness to people who already acknowledge that it's a sin? Well, let me give you three reasons why we're going to do that tonight. First of all, because there are some in our churches who acknowledge that drunkenness is a sin, but they still get drunk. I said this last Wednesday night, and I'll say it again. I'm not saying that all of these people are even truly converted, but we know for a fact that there are people sitting in our churches who would say they know the Bible says that drunkenness is a sin, but they still get drunk. They are overcome by intoxicating drink. And by the way, I would remind us tonight that the commandments against drunkenness are not just commandments against something public. It is a sin to get drunk in private. It's a sin if you get drunk at home. You say, well, you know, I do my drinking in private. I don't want to cause anybody to stumble. Nobody knows what I do. It's just really just me at home. I mean, is it a sin to be drunk there? Yes. The commandments against drunkenness are not just made concerning social settings and public settings. So there are some in our churches who acknowledge that drunkenness is a sin, but they still get drunk. Second, there are people in our churches who say they are not getting drunk, who are more influenced by alcohol than they want to admit than they want to acknowledge. It has become, drinking has become a regular part of their life. And they say they partake in moderation, and they say they're not getting drunk, but the reality is, in some of these cases, alcohol has a hold on that person. And so for that reason, we need to really give consideration to what the Bible says about drunkenness, and we need to really examine whether strong drink is having more influence on us than we might want to admit. But third, we preach this to people who acknowledge it as sin because there are people who acknowledge that drunkenness is a sin, but they still don't have the proper fear of it. If we really hear what the Bible says about this sin, if we really acknowledge that it's something hateful to God, something condemned by God, something that characterizes people who will be barred from heaven, if we ever really acknowledge the deadly, dangerous sin of drunkenness for what it is, wouldn't we be afraid of it? Wouldn't we be very careful, very wise in our attitude toward it? I believe there are people who say that they are moderationists when it comes to alcohol who aren't really very moderate. They indulge, they overindulge. But they argue that they believe in moderation. And there are people who, in the name of liberty, engage in license. And in the name of liberty in this area, in the name of liberty in the area of drinking, there are people who damage themselves and damage their family and damage their testimony and do damage to other believers. And I believe that this happens at least in part because even though they pay lip service to a belief in the sinfulness of drunkenness, they don't really have the fear of it that the Scriptures teach us to have. They say, oh, I drink in moderation, and they laugh at the idea of maybe just a little overindulgence instead of allowing the statements of Scripture about drunkenness to penetrate their thinking, their affections, and determine their choices. 
So tonight, what I want us to talk about is the sin, the deadly and dangerous sin of drunkenness. I took you first to Genesis chapter 9 because one of the interesting things in the study of Scripture is the first mention of something. And the question is, where do we find the first mention of wine? And the answer is right here in the verses that we've just read. Genesis 9 is the first time you'll find wine mentioned. Isn't it interesting that in the first mention of wine in the Bible, it is not associated with joy, it's not associated with blessing. It's associated with something that took place that was shameful and sinful. So that if nothing else, it's a clear lesson that from the very outset of its mention in Scripture, we have a warning about the power of intoxicating drink to lead to sin. The first mention of wine is associated with something sinful and shameful. And as I said last week, there are positive statements made about wine. We're going to deal with some of those either next week or in two weeks. If we're going to be honest with the Word of God, we have to deal with all of it, and we have to acknowledge all of it. But the first thing I want us to acknowledge is what God says about drunkenness, and I want you to see that the first mention of wine is in a negative context. You move on in your study of God's Word, and what you find is the Bible has a lot to say about drunkenness. I mean, God hasn't devoted a little space to it. He's devoted a lot of space to it. And wherever you find drunkenness mentioned in Scripture, it is consistently condemned. Again, let's be clear. I'm not talking about drinking now. I'm talking about drunkenness. The Bible condemns it. Romans chapter 13, verse 13 says this. By the way, we're going to deal with a lot of Scripture tonight because my goal tonight is, I know we all say, I know that drunkenness is a sin. Let's move on. Next subject. What I want you to do is I want you to interact with God's Word. I want you to hear. I want you not just to listen. I want you to hear. What God says in His Word about this subject. So we're going to look at a lot of different verses, and the best thing probably for you to do tonight is to listen. As you listen, jot those down, jot down the coordinates on the map, and you go back and you look them up and you read them and you meditate on them. Romans chapter 13, verse 13, let us walk properly, speaking to believers, let us walk properly as in the daytime, right? God's a God of light, we're a people of light, so let's walk in the light not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. I mean, there are certain things that believers are not characterized by, should not be characterized by. Jealousy is one. Quarreling is one. Sensuality is one. Sexual immorality is one. But drunkenness is also in that list. Believers are not to get drunk. Galatians 5.19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, Here it is, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Show me someone who is a drunkard. I mean, that is their character. That is how they're living their life. That is someone who does not have eternal life. There's a difference between someone being in the flesh and someone being in the Spirit. In the Spirit, we still battle with the flesh. In the flesh, we're natural. We're without the Spirit. We're without Christ. And the deeds of the flesh are evident. And one of the deeds that comes forth from the flesh is drunkenness. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
That's serious business, isn't it? These people will not be in heaven. And by the way, and I mentioned this last week, but I want to drive it home again. The Bible does not deal with drunkenness as a disease. The Bible deals with drunkenness as a sin. You would not be barred from heaven because of a disease. But sin is something that falls under the wrath of God. Idolatry is not a disease. Adultery is not a disease. Homosexuality is not a disease. Thievery is not a disease. Being greedy is not a disease. Being a reviler doesn't represent a disease. A swindler is not someone who has a disease. And listen, a drunkard doesn't either. That is not to say that some people may not be more physically predisposed to that sin. Nonetheless, it doesn't remove the fact that it's a violation of God's law. It's a sin. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Listen, you had enough time to live in sin when you were lost. That's what God's saying there. You've been saved. You ought to know that stuff is empty. You ought to know that stuff is destructive. You used to be there to do what the Gentiles still want to do. He's talking about lost humanity. Well, what characterizes lost humanity? Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Are there drinking parties taking place on college campuses this evening? Probably. Maybe not this evening. For sure on the weekend, right? Are there young people who claim to be Christians involving themselves in those drinking parties? Don't you know the time has passed? Don't you know this is what characterizes lost humanity? Drinking parties, drunkenness? 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. He's talking here about being spiritually alert. And he's contrasting a life of being alert with a life of being asleep. Another way to say it, a life of living in the light versus a life of living in the darkness. And isn't it interesting that when he gives us an example of life lived in darkness, he gives us the example of being drunk? I mean, the very thing that ought to characterize the Christian life as a whole is sobriety. We're not a people trying to escape reality. We're a people who understand reality. To live our lives with a mind that is alert and awake and vigilant and sober. Spiritually speaking, lost humanity lives in a drunken state all the time. Isaiah 28, Old Testament, Isaiah 28, verse 1. Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley of those who are overcome with wine. How does God describe His wayward people? He describes them as drunks, because that's what they had become, overcome with wine. Habakkuk 2.15, Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. And of course, we have the straightforward commandment of Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a commandment. Do not be drunk with wine. So the first example, the first mention of wine we have in the Bible is associated with shame and sin. And then you move through the Word of God and you find that drunkenness is condemned over and over and over again. But not only is drunkenness condemned for our own life, we're also told not to keep company with drunkards. The companionship of drunkards is addressed in Scripture. 
Proverbs 23, verse 20 says this, Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. You see, the glutton's in there too, because what he's describing are people who live for pleasure, not people who live for God. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. 1 Corinthians 5.11, But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. I mean, if somebody says they're a brother, but they're a drunkard, you disassociate from them. You say, now wait a second, Richard. Proverbs 23 is just a general statement to God's people not to be among drunkards. In the 1 Corinthians passage you just read, doesn't Paul say that he doesn't mean the people like this who are in the world because we'd have to go out of the world? Or rather, if someone says they're a brother, then you disassociate from them? Yeah, that's true. But once again, we need our minds to be honest with what Scripture is addressing. He's not saying that in the name of evangelism, to reach the drunkards and the swindlers and the sexually immoral and all the rest, we enter into their lifestyle with them. No, if my next door neighbor is a drunkard, I get to know him, I befriend him, I do everything I can to reach him, but I don't go to his drinking parties. If someone I'm wanting to witness to is a drunkard, I don't avoid him in Kroger's. I don't act like I don't know him in Walmart. The Word of God is not saying I can't go to dinner with him, but I don't go spend time in the bars with him. Let both statements say what they're saying. Don't be among drunkards. That has to do with how you're living your life. 1 Corinthians 5 is saying, listen, we're here to reach the world, not avoid the world. You don't disassociate from sinners because we're here to reach sinners. But if someone says they're a brother and he's living the lifestyle of a sinner... That is, he is a drunkard, or a swindler, or a viler, or an idolater, or sexually immoral, or greedy. You disassociate from him. Why? These sins are serious. They are to be addressed. The Bible, even in a metaphorical way, talks about companionship with drunkards. I want you to look to the book of Ezekiel, if you would, please. Ezekiel chapter 23. Ezekiel 23. Look at verse 36. The Lord said to me, Son of man, will you judge Ahala and Ahalibah? Ahala refers to Samaria. Ahalibah refers to Jerusalem. And literally the names refer to women of the tent, which is a reference to adultery. God's calling out for judgment against Samaria and Jerusalem because of their spiritual adultery. He says, verse 36, Declare to them their abominations, for they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. With their idols they have committed adultery, and they have even offered up to them for food the children whom they had borne to me. Moreover, this they have done to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slaughtered their children and sacrificed to their idols on the same day, They came into my sanctuary to profane it. Can you imagine offering your children in sacrifice and on the same day making your way to the temple, to the place where you were to worship God? And behold, this is what they did in my house. Verse 40, they even sent for men to come from afar to whom a messenger was sent. And behold, they came. For them you bathed yourself painted your eyes and adorned yourself with ornaments. Again, he's describing Samaria and Jerusalem in these figurative terms like a woman preparing herself for this adulterous relationship. Verse 41, you sat on a stately couch with a table spread before it on which you had placed my incense and my oil. The sound of a carefree multitude was with her and with men of the common sort Drunkards were brought from the wilderness, and they put bracelets on the hands of the women and beautiful crowns on their heads. You just had an idolatrous party, and you kept company with drunkards. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, 
Verse 36, But concerning that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, now what kind of a servant is being portrayed here in this parable? Wicked, right? If that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here is a wicked servant. He does not know the Lord. That is obvious from where he ends up chopped up in pieces and assigned a place with the hypocrites. And this is a man who gets drunk and spends his time with drunkards. So not only is drunkenness condemned, the companionship of drunkards is forbidden. And it's spoken of in these terms. So we see the first mention associated with shame and sin. We see direct condemnation of the sin of drunkenness. We see how God's Word describes companionship with drunkards. Fourth, I want you to see that drunkenness is dealt with also as a curse. The Bible not only condemns it and our association with it, but we also find where it is a part of the explanation for why entire societies are brought down. And in fact, it is described as a judgment from God on societies, that He gives them over to their drunkenness. Isaiah 28, 7. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine, they stagger with strong drink, they reel in vision, they stumble in giving judgment, for all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. There's a description of why Israel was in the condition they were in. Because their prophets and their priests had become drunkards, and their judgment was not sound. And as God describes it in only terms that God can, The tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. They've drunken themselves sick. You want to know why the people of God wandered away into idolatry and into sin? Well, one of the reasons why was drunkenness. It was at least symptomatic of their unfaithfulness to God. Look at Isaiah chapter 56 with me, if you would, please. Isaiah chapter 56. God here in Isaiah 56 promises blessing to His people for obedience, but then he deals with their sin. Isaiah 56, verse 1, Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. 
I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Next verse. All you beasts of the field come to devour. All you beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough, but they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. God says, listen, I've promised you a blessing if you'll obey me, but this is the condition of the nation, and this is the condition of its shepherds. Jeremiah 13, 11. If you want to turn there, you can. We can look at it together. Sometimes that helps rather than just listening. Jeremiah 13. Okay, verse 11, we'll read down to verse 16. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. You shall speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every jar shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, do we not indeed know that every jar will be filled with wine? In other words, they're going to take this as a statement of blessing. Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will fill with drunkenness all the inhabitants of this land. The kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will dash them one against another. Fathers and sons together, declares the Lord, I will not pity or spare or have compassion that I should not destroy them. Hear and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. God said, I'm about to judge you. And he pictures it with drunkenness. And he may well be describing, in fact, his giving them over to the intoxicating effects of wine, so that the nation walks into its own corruption. Ezekiel 23, 28. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver you into the hands of those whom you hate, into the hands of those from whom you turned in disgust. And they shall deal with you in hatred, and take away all the fruit of your labor, and leave you naked and bare. And the nakedness of your whoring shall be uncovered, your lewdness and your whoring have brought this upon you because you played the whore with the nations and defiled yourself with their idols. You have gone the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. Thus says the Lord God, you shall drink your sister's cup that is deep and large. You shall be laughed at and held in derision for it contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, a cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. God's judgment pictured with drunkenness. Habakkuk 2, 15. Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. Lamentations 4.21, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass, you shall become drunk 
and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, He will punish. He will uncover your sins. God judging Edom and picturing it with their drunkenness and their nakedness. So, first mention of wine associated with shame. Drunkenness condemned clearly and consistently throughout Scripture. Companionship of drunkards, pictured again as belonging to people who don't know the Lord and we are told not to do it. And then drunkenness presented as a curse, both that which characterizes a nation that is on the downgrade and God actually picturing His wrath upon a people in terms of drunkenness. Fifth, the Bible is very clear about the cost of drunkenness, the devastating effect of it. The first thing that stands out about it, it's a deceiving power. It deceives people. Drunkenness distorts a person's perception. Jeremiah 25, 16, they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. We read this last week. Look at it again with me. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, and look at verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine, do not look at wine when it's red. By the way, mixed wine, this doesn't refer to mixture with water. They would mix their wine also with spices and herbs. And so this is someone who has a taste for drink. They tarry long over it. They try all the various kinds of it. Verse 31, do not look at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler. Isn't it interesting? These are the names for wine, mocker, brawler. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. When you take all those verses together and all the others, but the cost of drunkenness is described, not only do you see it's deceptive, it distorts a person's perception. They stagger about, they have wounds that they can't explain the next day, all this sort of thing, even though it's not only a deceptive thing, It's described in terms of sorrow. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Proverbs 23 said. It's described in association with immorality, as we saw in Genesis 9. How many people who live immoral lives also are characterized by drunkenness? I wonder if you were to study the homosexual lifestyle, if you were to study the life of prostitutes, if you were to study people living in open sexual immorality, I wonder how many of them are also characterized by drunkenness. It's associated with injury, poverty, loss of all kinds, loss of health, loss in family life, loss of opportunity, usefulness, How many people, their work life has suffered because of drink? How many people, their family life has suffered because of drink? How many people have literally drunken themselves to death physically? Violence, addiction. Violence, you know, it's a brawler, the Bible says. I ask you, given all these statements we've seen tonight, if we've not just listened, if we've heard them, If we don't just say, oh, I know drunkenness is a sin, let's move on. If I really hear what God says about this sin, should it not put within me a holy fear of drunkenness? 
If God hates it, if God condemns it, if those who are characterized by it won't be in heaven, why would I want to live on the edge of it? Why would I want to flirt with it? What is drunkenness? That's an important question, isn't it? John MacArthur takes up that question, and here's his answer, and I think it's a good answer. What does drunkenness mean? It is the point at which alcohol takes over any part of your faculties. There are varying degrees of drunkenness, and I don't profess to know where that fine line is for everyone, but whenever you yield control of your senses to alcohol, you have become drunk. And I would say to us tonight that when someone has to have a drink to relax, when someone has to have a drink to enjoy themselves, you can't tell me that they're not relying on some level of drunkenness. I mean, if you have to have it to relax, if you have to have it to enjoy yourself, it has to be some quality found in that drink that you're dependent on. If it's just for enjoyment, then you can still relax and you can still have peace and joy, even if it was some other pleasure drink. Isn't it interesting that drunkenness is contrasted with the Holy Spirit's role in a believer's life? Ephesians 5.18, And do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but, what? Be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. By the way, that's not a comparison. You hear charismatics talk about being drunk on the Spirit, and they say, you know, it's comparable, the effects are comparable. It's not a comparison, it's a contrast. Don't get drunk with wine, that's debauchery. You be filled with the Spirit. But I do think there are some comparisons in this way. There are people who look to the bottle for their joy, who look to alcohol for their peace, who look to alcohol for their courage, for their boldness, for their relaxation, for their rest. There are even some people who try to insist that alcohol makes them better at what they do. There are lots of golfers who think that. And after a few, you don't want to be playing in front of them. Listen, we as God's people... Don't look to a substance for that. The Lord is our joy. The Lord is our peace. The Lord is our courage. The Lord is our boldness. He is my rest. He is my relaxation. He's the one who gives me abilities that I wouldn't have apart from Him. And by the way, I would also note it's not just alcohol that people can experience a kind of drunkenness with. We must avoid anything that alters our consciousness, unless it's needful as medicine for a good reason. James McDonald from a sermon entitled, Wise Up About Alcohol, offered these figures. Studies show that even small amounts of alcohol impair wisdom. Studies show that after taking three bottles of beer, there's an average net loss of memory 13%. Trained typists were tested and their errors increased 40% after just small amounts of alcohol. One ounce of alcohol retards muscular reaction, 17%. One ounce of alcohol increases the amount of time needed to make a decision by 10%. One ounce of alcohol increases errors due to lack of attention by 35%, due to muscular coordination by almost 60%. My wife loves ER programs. Anybody else like those? Emergency room shows on TV? I hate them. She loves them. We watch them, okay? That's how that works. Two nights ago, we're watching one of these emergency rooms in Hawaii. And if you've watched these programs, you know they'll track, you know, five to six patients throughout a night. And you'll keep shifting from one person's case to another, and they keep up with them and let you know. 
this was on my mind, and I couldn't help but notice. I don't know how many they tracked that night, probably five or six, but four of those people in that emergency room that night were in there in one way or another in connection with drinking. One man was having seizures because he hadn't had alcohol and he was going through withdrawals. Others were in there with injuries that were related either to fights or accidents that had to do with drinking. God condemns drunkenness. I didn't say God condemns drinking. We're going to deal with this subject in light of wisdom as we go along. But God condemns drunkenness. Question, why didn't God just forbid it? I mean, something so dangerous, so deadly, potentially. Why didn't He just forbid it? And we'll get to that in due course, but next week what we'll do is we'll look at some places where God did. Where God said no drinking in some cases. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, we thank You that You love us enough. You love us perfectly. You love us in this way. That You not only direct our steps in a way that's joyful and healthy and good for us, but You warn us about things that would lead us to death. And Lord, I know that probably everyone in this room tonight would have said before we even started that they know that drunkenness is a sin. But I pray that tonight, Lord, we have heard You, that we don't just lightly pass by that knowledge, but we allow it to penetrate our thinking, affect our affections, and determine our choices. Lord, just as we are careful with other things that You clearly say You hate and that You condemn, I pray that we would not flirt with drunkenness, that we would not live near the edge of it. We love you. We thank you for your love for us and your Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.